Tourists of today marvel about the distinct variances between each town, the notable variations in food and language, and the other tiny nuances that render Italy appear to be a less single country than an assortment of culturally connected locations in an unusually beautiful landscape. You're in for an unforgettable experience wherever you visit Italy, believe me. There is unlimited adventure and stunning beauty to take in. From the Apennine Mountains to the Alabasa coast of Puglia, the towering Dolomites to the dazzling Tyrrhenian Sea. So, how is Italy doing? Let's find out. Italy's geography. Italy is a nation in South Central Europe that sits atop a peninsula jutting far into the Mediterranean Sea. Italy is frequently referred to be a boot-shaped country since it has some of the most diverse and beautiful scenery on the planet. The Alps, one of the largest and most untamed mountain ranges in the entire globe, are situated at its wide summit. The highest mountains in Italy are located along Mont Blanc, which has a summit in France, as well as Monte Rosa, which has a peak in Switzerland. Rome, the country's capital, is considered to be one of the oldest and most famous cities in the entire world. Tourists adore traveling to Rome to view its magnificent buildings and masterpieces of artwork in addition to partake in the city's Dolce Vita, or Sweet Life. Further significant towns comprise the enormous southern metropolis of Naples, the manufacturing and fashion hub of Milan, the attractive port city of Genoa, as well as Venice, perhaps the oldest tourist attractions in the entire globe. This rough terrain has affected the political geography of Italy. No wonder, right? Italy's cities and villages have a long tradition of self-sufficiency, autonomy and distrust amongst each other since there aren't many straight roadways connecting them and getting far from one place to the next is typically challenging. Over the course of its more than 3,000 year history, Italy has seen periods of intercommon conflict, brief unity and protracted divisions, as well as collapsed powers. Italy has been at peacetime for over 50 years now and its citizens benefit from outstanding standards of living and a well-developed culture. But does that make it paradise? We are here to say that Italy is complicated. Let's see. Italian economy. After World War II, the Italian economy was among the poorest in all of Europe. Today, it is among the strongest. Its metallurgical and technical sectors are its strongest suits, while the shortage of raw resources and energy supplies are its limitations. The majority of energy used in Italy is imported. However, the chemical industry also does well, and one of Italy's biggest sectors is textiles. Exports of manufactured goods expanded phenomenally as a result of an overwhelming entrepreneurial inclination and open trade laws that were implemented after the war. But a burdensome bureaucracy and inadequate planning prevented a uniform economic growth across the nation. The importance of services, especially tourism, cannot be overstated. Towards the close of the 20th century, Italy got its soaring inflation under control and pursued more cautious fiscal strategies, notably extensive privatization, in an effort to achieve parity with other EU countries. In comparison to the early 20th century, when economic activity was mostly agrarian, the entire nation is comparatively rich. Tourism plays a significant role in the country's success since its prosperous years. There are almost as many tourists as residents. Italy is a member of the European Union, the Council of Europe and the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, NATO. It also has a strategically significant location on the southern flank of Europe. So you might be wondering, what does this mean? In the end, does Italy have a good or bad economy? You want a definite answer, right? The conclusions are horrifying for Italy. Italy is among the least productive of the old European states right behind Portugal when it comes to productivity, which is measured by 114 indicators covering infrastructure, education, politics, macroeconomic data, public services, and innovation. The nations that have surpassed Italy include Chile, Azerbaijan, Thailand, Poland, and Malaysia. Why? For a variety of reasons, actually. Italy is ranked 134th for government regulation, 126th for transparency and policy making, and 126th for the effectiveness of public spending, to name a few. The list is long, sadly. Italians pay the 126th highest amount of taxes in the world. This is the maximum taxpayers in Italy may contribute. While doing so, the nation is third to last in the world in terms of its ability to draw in foreign investment and 120th in terms of loan availability. The image becomes painfully obvious when you take into account the country's massive public debt 133.1% of GDP 
and its rating in the World Economic Forum report on bank stability, 116th. We are not done yet, as more than any other nation in Europe, Italy has a regionally disparate economy. North versus South Italy. Over 17 million working poor individuals comprise Italy's 4.4 million impoverished population. One of Italy's tragedies is an undeveloped South. While the Italian economy launched the industrialization journey relatively late, the region in the north of the nation quickly grew up and surpassed several of its Western European neighbors, but Southern Italy trailed behind. Italy's north-south division was created by the Kingdom of the Two Sicilies, a group of city-states that existed generations before Italian unification. Greeks, Normans and Lombards who moved in large numbers from their native countries made up the majority of the population in southern Italy. On the other hand, the Roman Empire briefly governed the north, which was a powerful region at the time. Later, between the Middle Ages and the end of the 18th century, Napoleon and Charlemagne both had an impact on this region. Northern Italy has always been a centre for agriculture and technological advancement, which has helped to build an efficient economy based on trade and business. After Italy's unification, an uneven distribution of southern lands caused an agricultural crisis that departed countless farmers with plots that were much too tiny to produce large quantities of crops or to make a living income. In the very first significant Italian exodus caused by bad land management practices, millions of Italians fled difficult living circumstances and went to dozens of nations on practically each continent. Even now, hundreds of years later, Southern Italy's agricultural sector remains insignificant compared to the northern farmlands with richer soil along with greater resources, which additionally boosts the northern economy and widens the north-south gap. Compared to the EU average of 5%, 3.6% of Italians were employed in agriculture in 2013, with workers from the 12 municipalities in the north and centre surpassing those from the 8 areas in the south. The GDP of Calabria in the south is just 56% of the EU average, whereas Lombardy in the north has a GDP per capita that is equal to 127% of the average for the entire EU. Historical economists concur that the unequal distribution of industry, which is centred in the north, is a significant indirect contributing factor to Italy's north-south split, despite the fact that the root causes are debatable. Hold on. Such disparity is not the end of the story. Italy is coming stronger. Never lose hope. Italy's role in the G7. We have some great news here. While the Japanese presidency works on specific plans to combat the poly crisis through the end of 2023, arrangements for the Italian presidency in 2024 are already getting action. Yay! It's going to be possible for Italy to portray itself as a powerful, trustworthy and successful player in the area of development cooperation both inside the G7 and its connection with the Global South thanks to the G7 Presidency. The next G7 Presidency has the responsibility of thinking about, collaborating with and forging agreements with other significant transactional bodies such as the G20 in order to assure sustainability in a number of crucial domains connected to development cooperation. Sounds complicated, right? Let's simply see what this means for Italy. The Italian government will take part in numerous significant meetings over the coming months that will discuss various development issues and help create a shared narrative leading up to the country's next G7 presidency. These summits will serve as critical litmus tests for judging the government's response to a variety of core concerns like food security, climate change, financial inclusion and development. There are also high hopes on how Italy could definitely play a significant role in a number of industries to maximise effect. Time flies. We will see. Now let's imagine yourself as an important European economic expert and think about that. Will Italy cause a fresh European debt crisis? Since coming to office earlier in 2018, Italy's authorities have found themselves on a collision course with the EU. They assert that the bloc's technocratic regulations have contributed to economic stagnation and attribute the nation's double-dip recession following the 2008 financial crisis on EU-imposed austerity measures. Since then, Italy has struggled to develop at less than 1%, trailing most of the European countries, and its young unemployment rate remains above 30%, only surpassed by Greece and Spain. Rome wants to increase spending because it believes that doing so would increase employment, productivity and growth that will ultimately make it simpler to pay down the debt in the future. Let's stay optimistic. The cost of government borrowing is increasing in the meanwhile, 
the yield on government bonds, which represents the price the government has to shell out for issuing debt, has been almost doubled and is now at its greatest point in four years. This indicates that investors view Italy as a more hazardous investment. Italy carries the fourth largest overall debt burden in the entire globe, totaling a little over 2.6 trillion. Huge, right? Actually, it's not just huge, it's more than twice what is permitted by EU regulations, at almost 131% of gross domestic product GDP. Italy's debt payments might grow out of hand if investors panic and bond rates increase, as occurred to crisis-ridden European nations in 2010 to 2012. That could indicate an Italian default, which would have implications for banks that own Italian government bonds throughout Europe. Investors throughout the European Union could incur huge losses if Italy undertakes the unusual step of abandoning the euro and switching to the lira, perhaps setting off a new financial catastrophe. Italy would turn out to be far too large to save if the eurozone was in danger. In 2012, the European Central Bank, ECB, intervened, promising to take whatever it takes to halt the spread of disease. Due to its historical divides, economic difficulties and political unpredictability, Italy's destiny is unclear. But populist movements with consistent resources could be able to keep the country afloat. Did you find this video interesting? Share your thoughts with us in the comments section below. And don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe to our channel.